We have one question, John. Oh, well, just good. just Thank a moment. You. I just realized I didn't have the recording on, so okay. I just started the meeting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. But John, I have a question. Okay. You are uh, explaining many times to us that um, tables and relationships among tables in lay, say in a RDBMS. Right. They are, they are in some sense almost equivalent to ontologies. But what is different? The difference between ontology and a complex relational database where you know you manipulate keys in a different way and show various types of relations well the ontology is going to define the uh, labels that you put on things uh, the kinds of things that there are so the ontology you need an ontology whether you have a relational database or a graph database it's going to be and if you want to move data smoothly between the two you want to have a common set of labels. Unfortunately, the uh, most general labels that we have are the words in ordinary language. And as we all know, those words have a huge number of different word senses and they shift from one uh, document to another. In fact, just from one person to another, that two different people will have slightly different variations in what they mean by various words. So. Uh, that's why you're going to, for the web, you have to deal with a rather vague kind of ontology that includes anything imaginable. And that means you're going to have very general dictionaries with very loose kind of definitions. On the other hand, for a particular application, you want to have very precise mappings to and from the, your computer programming that uh, programs that require very precise mapping. So you'll need a very precise ontology for that, for any particular application. And that creates the big problem you have in ontology. How do you relate all these very narrow, precise ontologies to some very huge, vague ontology that accommodates anything and everything? But what what happened to RDBMS in the process? In the RDMS, RDMS, the difference between an RDB uh, between a relational database and a graph database is purely computational. Uh, for ontology, ignore the difference because it's irrelevant. Uh, the question is, if you want to have a precise program that is doing very precise computation, you want your graph database and your relational database will require identical ontologies so there's and if you're but if you're dealing with the web where you have anything and everything you need a, a very uh, loose kind of uh, taxonomy or dictionary or with the thesaurus or whatever you need the kind of stuff that people uh, deal with when they're talking about an open-ended variety of data with uh, folksonomies and uh, and any tweet that anybody can imagine uh, being using any words that anybody can imagine, that's what you have to deal with when you're dealing with the web. Uh, yeah, I was, I was just wanting to understand what ontologies have to do to align with a, a working RDBMS that is complex, little bit. It has dynamic. With with, RD, with RDBMS, with, an R, with a relational database and a graph database, you need identical ontologies. Now, the question about whether they're changing dynamically, there's no reason why you can't change a, uh, a relational database just by adding another relation or expanding one that already exists there. So the only question is uh, the speed of change. Mm -hmm. And the point is that if you have it, if, uh, let's say that uh, let's t consider Matthew West uh, de designing ontologies for the oil industry, and then he has shell ontology, and where you have the shell uh, organization and the uh, people working there uh, have very strict uh, requirements. They have defined a very, very precise ontology for their business. And they have also collaborated with other uh, 
with the other companies and organizations for the entire industry to have uh, very strict ontologies for that industry. So those ontologies are going to be fixed and they're, they're change, they change very slowly. On the other hand, if you're going to deal with the uh, World Wide Web, you probably do not want a uh, relational database for the web because the uh, uh, the uh, it's the data is the uh, uh, rows and columns are going to have lots of empty spaces. It's going to be very sparse data, so you probably will not want a uh, uh, relational database to handle the all the data on the web. So that's why um, some sort of a graph representation that links things together in a loose way is what you'll have. On the other hand, when you want to do something precise, you're going to have to download it and use a precise ontology for that particular uh, application. And so it, this has nothing to do with, uh, so for the time being, just, just don't worry about uh, the difference between a relational database and a graph database. Think only in terms of whether you're talking about a, pre a, a narrow, precise application or uh, a vague sort of thing that covers the whole web. I got it. I I got it. So, uh, <coughs> if we leave the web out of equation, then ontology becomes more precise and is mappable to the RTBMS or is able to be synced. Is that yeah. the message? Well, okay. <laughs> when it, when you talk about uh, just talk about databases and. Uh, knowledge bases and the web. So for a local database where you have total control over what's there, you have, uh, you can make your own decision. Spreadsheets, for example, spreadsheets are just as, are just tables. And uh, you're, and so a lot of people use spreadsheets. Anything, anything that you can use a spreadsheet for, you can put into an RDB. Because a spreadsheet is, uh, an R, a relational database is designed to map to and from a spreadsheet, a system of spreadsheets in a completely precise way. Uh, but the thing is that if you're doing with ordinary language, anything can be uh, can pop up anywhere in a quotation or a comment anywhere in language. And so you're not really going to map a relation, uh, a, uh, so if you, any semantic representation of a document in ordinary language is first will be translated to a graph and um, then some parts of that graph may be related to something stored in uh, a more precise database, which could be an RDB or it could be a graph DB. So the, that's purely implementation. As the implementation of a table or a graph is pure uh, computational convenience, and that has nothing to do with the ontology. The ontology has to deal with whether it's changing rapidly because uh, whether you have, if, if, if you don't have control over what's over the system, that means anything can happen. Surprises are inevitable, and anything on the web, you have no idea what's going to pop up on the web in the next uh, uh, two minutes. But if you have your own application on which you have total control, then you can have a precise ontology. But for the whole web, you can't have a precise ontology. <laughs> Um, this also, to some extent, relates to what um, Ken started out with, with of the question of pragmatics. That the um, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't we don't have a common way of talking about pragmatics here, and we're we're tending to talk about syntax and semantics, um, whereas uh, the the pragmatics of what you would do with um, something. Um, you know, we, we should have that. We should have a systematic way of, of discussing that, um, and the how syntax and semantics um, only get you part of the way towards success with the communication, and then you need some pragmatics um, to be able to do something. You know, to have some effect, desirable effect. Yeah, that certainly is true, and uh, pragmatics gets into context. And uh, also, not just the context, but the different people who happen to be interacting in the context, because the buyer and the seller have different pragmatics. 
uh, that they're talking about the same thing, but they have different purposes. Or you could have a system where you have a courtroom where you've got uh, <clears throat> the judge, the jury, the uh, defendant, uh, the plaintiff, uh, uh, the, uh, the defendant and the uh, uh, prosecutor, and the and uh, then all kinds of witnesses and all of the dialogues you have, uh, and then all of them have lawyers and all of the, and everyone in the room has a different uh, goal or purpose or role to play in this whole thing. And uh, uh, just one room with all those people in it, you have an immense number of different viewpoints and different purposes and different goals for e each of the, for everybody who's interacting. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and a courtroom is a good example for um, things that are accomplished with speech acts because there, um, there are different kinds of speech acts that um, take place there. And ultimately, you know, there, there are, uh, you know, there's some kind of effects, commitments, um, you know, that are enforced at the end of it um, after going through this process of communicating back and forth. Um, I think the big elephant in the room, I think, for the whole question of the semantic web has been that it cut off the question of pragmatics and hoped to, it hoped to reduce semantics to syntax and, and um, ignore the question of context and perspective and um, you know, goals, um, belief, desire, intent, that kind of thing. Um, and it, it really would be um, you know, now that people are oriented toward knowledge graphs um, as sort of a, uh, you know, more accessible way of getting into the um, syntax and the semantics of, um, uh, you know, of some kind of common syntax and semantics, um, it would be great to add on the questions of pragmatics to that. Um, you know, you had called the knowledge graphs, um, but lightweight semantic nets, um, and uh, it, that's a, it's like a stepping stone into other things that if that could be systematically uh, presented, what's, what's lacking, what's, what's there and what's lacking. Yes, that's, those are very important issues. And that, uh, in fact, one of the main problems with the semantic web is that uh, the DAMO project was just one tiny little project. And uh, the thing is that uh, uh, Tim uh, Berners-Lee uh, pro uh, first proposed the, uh, the idea of a semantic web in 1994. He started the semantic web project in uh, uh, 1989. And five years later, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, World Wide Web was going very well very strong and there were an immense number of applications and that's when he said that it was a good idea to move to uh, consider semantics. Now that was a good idea at the time, but it was not at all clear how to go about it and there was all kinds of things that were uh, under development in those days. And uh, then Tim proposed, uh, or, let's see, no, it was Jim Hendler was at that time uh, uh, at the uh, at uh, DARPA, they would have uh, academic people who were uh, uh, to take over and uh, control certain projects. And uh, Jim Hendler came in for a two-year assignment as an academic. And one of the things that he proposed was uh, uh, this uh, DAMO project, which was the uh, basically uh, uh, a uh, DARPA Markup language for uh, uh, the uh, for the for defense applications and the for DoD kinds of applications, and uh, then uh, Tim Berner Tim proposed a uh, project which got funding that won the funding and his initial proposal in 2000, I believe, is uh, it, it's very interesting to look at uh, Jim Hendler's original. Uh, write-up uh, that uh, uh, outlined the project and then the uh, project that and then the proposal that Tim wrote in 2000 and both of those are much more general 
than what happened with the Damo project. And uh, one of the things that I blame is uh, uh, that uh, there were uh, that um, a whole group of people that were proposing description logics. I use the term hijacked, and that might be a bit strong. But what they did is that they uh, uh, a whole bunch of them joined that uh, collaboration, and they outvoted uh, everybody else. So. Uh, uh, Pat Hayes was collaborating with Guha. Guha started, uh, is the one who actually started the uh, RDF system itself. And Pat Hayes is, as we all know, a, a, an AI and logic guy and knowledge base guy from way back. And the two of them collaborated with this proposal to have a common uh, semantic standard based on common logic. And uh, the description logic people didn't like that because they wanted, they had their own kind of things and they, caused this split and caused this huge narrowing. They caused this very, very narrow specialty for uh, the uh, for the uh, uh, for the description logics. And they said, oh, the description logics are more efficient. And the answer is no, the description logics are uh, for certain kinds of reasoning are more efficient than first order logic uh, that are, are more efficient only because they narrow the logic to such a narrow point that you have a very precise, very narrow logic and uh, for which they have polynomial time. But you can't, any polynomial with the uh, exponent greater than two doesn't scale to the web. So OWL cannot scale to the web. Uh, and the whole idea of narrowing it, they narrowed it to the point where it's irrelevant. And uh, the, this is not what uh, Jim Hendler's view was in 2000. It's not what the DOD's view was in 2000. It's not what uh, uh, Tim uh, had in mind in 2000. And so the uh, five-year project that gave us OWL and RDF and OWL was just a preliminary first pass guess at what's happened. And then what happened is that people have a taken that thing as if it's gospel truth and no it was just a very tiny little portion of what tim and uh, hendler and all the others had in mind i i think also there was a fear that uh companies like cycorp since they had the ability to actually make uh the semantic web work uh that they might end up accidentally taking over and dominating the you know the the field uh, yes, that was the fear that uh, Guha had. Guha had been the associate uh, director of Psych uh, back in 1991, and he wrote his PhD dissertation with John McCarthy on context and the idea of context and micro theories. That was uh, the idea of McCarthy, uh, who uh, uh, was the uh, thesis advisor for Guha, and uh, then Guha. Uh, had some ideas that uh, he disagreed with uh, Lennett, and that's not unusual. Uh, Lennett uh, would typically, um, uh, and his, a lot of the people working with him, would eventually uh, fall out uh, over the years. But the thing is that Guha was afraid that uh, uh, Lennett and Syke would dominate. And actually, uh, I don't think there was any danger of that happening because the 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 amount of data in the web is far more than Psych could handle. And uh, the thing is that I, I believe that Psych would have been a far better basis for uh, the designing the web than uh, the uh, description logics. The OWL is such a, a an insignificant subset of uh, Psych that it just cut away everything that was important. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I think they wanted it to uh, almost anyone who, you know, with a certain level of education, to be able to write their own Sparkle server, their own inference server, you know, without, and and that that was kind of a mistake. If if I think if Tim Berners Lee would have said, okay, this is our standard and actually made it common logic, you know, or some or at least as good as Kif was at that moment, or L base from Pat Hayes, I think the world. I think people would have stepped up and made it work, even though it, it isn't trivial to make an, an inference engine that's capable of doing these things. But I, you know, I think the fear is was is that that 
people had to be able to create inference engines with very little knowledge of how to create inference engines, which is right. That was a ba basic problem. Also, the other thing is that they thought that the idea of inferencing was the most important part, and that's because AI had been working with inference engines from uh, uh, the very early days. In fact, the first theorem prover, uh, major theorem prover, was uh, by Hao Wang in 1959, and in seven minutes' time, seven minutes of CPU time, they proved uh, that Wang and his uh, proved all uh, 300, uh, over 380 some uh, theorems in first order logic in the Principia Mathematica. So every one of the theorems in first order logic, uh, 300 some, were proved uh, by Hao Wang's theorem prover in 1959. And that uh -huh. was an amazing achievement that showed that, hey, first order logic is very powerful, but there's far more that it cannot do. And uh, the thing is that uh, there's no reason to go to uh, description logics. It, 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 you know, th that's just, it's just has nothing to offer uh, other than uh, a smoke screen. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, there's, it seems to, like I find, I, I see this a lot. Uh, people will see KIF, they'll see common logic, and they'll assume it's first order logic. Uh, just off the bat, I mean, it, it is sure it's first order logic, but it can be whatever order you know you want it to be. It's right you know, where where you want to quantify is up to you. But you know, I I have seen like people afraid of it just because oh that looks like first order logic or that's sort of a prolog system. SQL is first order logic. Yeah. Okay. And prolog is uh, prolog is actually horn clause logic, but it can be used to do a theorem pro write a theorem prover for everything. And prolog runs circles around OWL. I mean, OWL is an extremely uh, inefficient implementation, and uh, there's no and uh, you can download OWL into a prolog, and it runs faster in prolog than the original OWL. The mm -hmm. point is that the the that what makes something slow is not the no language you write it in, but the uh, algorithms that you use so that uh, you can write a very efficient uh, OWL processor in, OWL, in Prolog. And uh, the point is that, uh, but the point is that you don't, the, the, the efficiency depends, uh, the t execution time depends entirely on the algorithm. It does not depend in any way on the language that you use to express it. So the only thing that you get by using OWL is the inability to express a lot of things that you want to say. That's all it does. OWL simply prevents you from saying things that you many people will really need to say. You just can't say it. And that's all it does. It's just a, a blockade that says, thou shalt not say this. That's all it does. <laughs> it doesn't help you in the slightest. So uh, if I may interject a little bit into this uh, discussion. Um, as it happens, I was part of DAML. Okay. <laughs> I was one of the original authors of Okay. DAML. Who is this uh, speaking at the moment? Ken. So I, Ken. I know I know a little bit about oh, oh, who, who, who is talking. This is Ken. 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 Oh, Ken. Uh, okay, Ken. Yes. Ken. Okay, good. Yeah, I was part of that. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, there's just a lot I could tell you about, you know, how it how it came about. It was a relatively small group of people. I mean, we had a a meeting, and it broke up into groups, and I was in the group that was going to that was developing the language. Yeah. And uh, being a database person, of course, I actually wanted to have SQL features in the um, in the language, which would have made it basically first order logic. Right. Right. And they they said no. Yeah. Well, see, that's the point. So that's what the, happened right at the start. Right. The other thing Pat, I wanted. Pat Hayes was also involved in that, and he um, was saying, "No, you don't want to do. That. Don't want to do that." Well, Pat Hayes, yeah, well, it, yeah, there's a, it's a whole story I could tell you about how Pat Hayes was involved. Yeah, well, I, I've 
you know, I've been working with Pat Hayes well, for right. years, so I know very oh, well yeah, his I, point I, of view. I worked yeah. with him too. And, yeah. But um, but that's that's not really relevant for this. The other thing I was I proposed was to have the ability to uh, form small, relatively small parts. Uh, what what um, is often called a situation, so bar wise and uh, that that sort of notion. So oh, situation semantics, yes. Situation semantics, because I felt that if you could if you could have a way of getting a, a kind of a smaller graph, and um, you could then um, perform a closed world logic within an open world framework. Yeah. And that would be far more efficient. So you could basically do database work, even though you're, you're, entire, you know, you're working with the entire web, which is huge. But by looking at a smaller situation, you could then do much more efficient reasoning. And they turn right. that down too. Well, yeah, see, I think that, that RDF does do a good job, or and Al does actually do a good job at is at aligning SQL servers as far as you know mapping columns, right? At least it does that, and that's about pretty much, you know. So at least that that works. It's just hard to to do what you said, create context where you have like a a small micro theory of assertions because these assertions the most detailed magnet or the the highest resolution you get is a triple which is just not you can't put enough detail into a triple but at least it's good at aligning databases well i agree with that but basically uh you can do that with just the type hierarchy itself you don't need anything uh, you don't need anything more than just a hierarchy of all the types and subtypes and one of the things that uh, uh, a lot of people use for uh, uh, for analyzing an owl uh, the, uh, ontology and searching for uh, errors and uh, contradictions is to use formal concept analysis called FCA and uh, there uh, that what that does is it will take any collection of just simple attributes, so that if you have a, if you have a definition in which um, uh, every type is defined by just a list of monadic relations, uh, our will just uh, take any definition in terms of a list of monadic uh, relations and create a uh, a complete lattice that shows all of the inheritance paths in that thing automatically with just a press of a button. And uh, you can take WordNet or uh, Roger's thesaurus or any kind of hierarchy or any kind of definitions from uh, uh, anywhere, anywhere. And you can just with a push of a button, you get the, uh, a complete lattice with all of the multiple multi-inheritance paths in it generated automatically and you can use that to define the labels on your rdb the labels on your uh, uh, spreadsheets the labels on your graphs all of that can be done with just a push of a button and i think that's what very important for the future is to design stuff that uh requires very very little or no knowledge on the part of the people who are entering the data and which will automatically detect any kind of co uh, conflicts uh, that are found in those definitions and then will generate the formal stuff automatically. That's what you really need. And those are the kinds of issues that uh, uh, Tim uh, and uh, Tim uh, and uh, Jim were talking about in 2000 and uh, there were there was a lot of input from all sorts of people in the uh, years in, in the late 1990s and the point is that uh, the dl people just i use the word hijacked because they really forced it into their particular solution they had one uh, solution and they forced everything into that one solution and that was a disaster or uh, it wasn't a disaster, but it just it just destroyed we the vision so that Tim more. had. The what? Could have had so much more than what we got out of it. We we got this, you know, piddly. I mean, this barely useful thing, and we could have had so much more. 
And I think yes. that the reason people were signed up for the semantic web in the first place was the success of the other so much more that had been happening in the years prior. Right. And, yep. Right. And but so, the thing what came out in 2005 was just the first pass cut. There was just one project, one five year project, and that was terminated in 2005. And uh, uh, the DOD was not really happy with what came out. So they didn't fund any more. And the semantic web is defined by what ended in that's uh, 19 years ago. And here we are 19 years later, immensely more work has been done in AI, knowledge representation, and uh, machine learning. And an immense amount of new ideas have come up. And nothing has happened to the technology because it's frozen at the yeah, stage of 2005. OK, so uh, actually, there were a number of issues and comments that were made um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I thought we might um, try to address some of these. Uh, Can I say see. first, um, Ken, and with regard to what has just been discussed here, I think sure. it would be good for the communicate to, to aim to produce some graphics that show how these things fit together, how all these dimensions fit together, um, you know, from low level representation to processing of the representation to, you know, the efficiency of the algorithms, um, and then to different uses, interoperability questions, what you can represent, um, you know, getting to the um, question of context and micro theories. And as you were saying, um, Ken, the, the um, you know, small representations, and then to pragmatics and the uses and the users and the, um, you know, the visualizations, uh, the benefit of visualizations. Um, you know, if we could have all those, like with that German uh, site that I keep forgetting that does all the theories together, um, HET, um, that John had pointed to a few times. Oh, Kill Mosakovsky? Yes. What's yeah. the name of the What's the name yes. of the site? Uh, DOL uh, is the uh, domain object. Uh, uh, no, is that is that that's DOL? No, that's the uh, uh, the uh, for, um, well, HETS H E H E T S okay. dot hets. edu. The HETS right. of the software, and okay. uh, Till is one of the chief designers of that. Okay, so if if we could aim towards some kind of big picture. Um, representation like the graphic, uh, I don't know if there are multiple graphics there, but very impressive. Um, that would be great for the communique. Okay. Um, that would help tell this story too about where where description logic and all fit into the picture, where a lightweight semantic network fits into a picture with the other things. Well, my IKL web uh, page uh, has the uh, uh, layer cakes that uh, uh, in, uh, in the proposal, in, the, uh, uh, in Jim Hendler's proposal, had the original layer cake in which he wanted first order logic, higher order logic, and fuzzy logic. He wanted all three of those in, in the proposal. And then there was the uh, layer cake that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that that's also the 2000 layer cake. And uh, that's on my website, it's uh, jfsoa.com slash IKL. And if you go there, just jfsoa.com slash IKL, and that will give you the uh, uh, diagrams there. So there's a diagram that shows uh, the three schema architecture that came up. That was in, that was the uh, relation, uh, that was the uh, idea of the uh, different schemas for defining databases, both graph databases and relational databases. That came out in the 1970s. And the final report on that was 1978. And that was a proposal, that was, came out as an ANSI technical report. And that did, never went into become a standard because one of the vendors, namely Oracle, uh, wanted to block anything that would facilitate uh, migration from one database to another because by that time and by the uh, 1980 or so uh, Oracle had a uh, 
uh, dominant position in SQL. And so they did not want a, to make SQL completely interoperable with everything else because that would mean that people could migrate away from Oracle and they wanted to block that. So Oracle had been a, uh, uh, a block, uh, had been blocking standards in, uh, or, or taking standards and just weakening them to the point where they were uh, uh, not strong enough to enforce interoperability. So that, that came out in 78. Then I have the di uh, diagrams for uh, Jim Hendler's diagram of 2000, Tim Berners-Lee's, and then the different diagrams for the uh, semantic web. And the point that I make is that the two diagrams by Hendler and uh, Berners-Lee are far superior to the uh, result that came out in uh, 2005. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm looking at that now. So that's, um, so if we could relate knowledge graphs to this explicitly, to use the common, the language that people are currently using. Yes, I think that so, would be good. We could do something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really good. Now, you, you can download any of these graphs from uh, my website if you want to because actually I stole them from uh, everywhere else and I put at the bottom of my line and says if anybody who owns a copyright to this and objects I will remove it nobody has ever ob objected so mm -hmm. that's my excuse good okay so Ken I want to get back to what you were doing with the questions then. No, that was a that was a good thing you did, Janet, because we discuss but then we often forget how we will use what we discuss. Yeah. And I think today what we discussed is what are the things involved in knowledge graphs and how to present them and what kind of overview visual we can create that makes it clear to the communicate reader or the summit reader uh, the concept of knowledge graph. Where right. the gap, where, how it's related and with what it has been related in the past. So that was very great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it, it provides integration. Yeah. authoritative context for uh, knowledge graphs. Yeah, I sh uh, should add more to that. I, you know, I've been tied up with other things, so, but uh, I really should add another section to update this with more stuff. Oh, by the way, there's also my uh, web page on the semantic, on, uh, this is the uh, uh, standard, uh, this is about semantic networks. I uh, uh, wrote the article on semantic networks for Wiley's Encyclopedia of AI, that in 1992, and I kept updating that over the years, so uh, but I have not yet added anything about knowledge graphs to that. And you can find my semantic web article. It's jfsoa.com slash pubs, pubs, P-U-B-S, slash semnet, S-E-M-N-E-T dot H-T-M. So that's my, yes, uh, that's my article on semantic, uh, that's the, article that I wrote for the uh, Encyclopedia of AI in 1992, and I've kept adding more and more to that over the years, but uh, I still haven't added anything more on knowledge graphs, but I should add, I should put some more on knowledge graphs to it. So I have a question for you, John. How close is CGIF to what people are calling knowledge graphs right now? Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, you can take the CGIF notation and represent any uh, any of these uh, semantic networks in terms of it, including knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs are just a very small subset, so it would be trivial to map that into. Uh, CGIF is an, a linearization of common logic in uh, such a way that it has a direct mapping to conceptual graphs, but it also has a direct mapping to Peirce's existential graphs and to other kinds of graphs so that it's the difference between uh, essentially anything you can express in common logic, you can represent in CGIF in an, uh, in an exactly uh, compatible way so that you can upload and download uh, freely. And uh, 
And, and so if you can represent it in uh, CLIF, you can represent it in CGIF. And uh, so OWL2 could be mapped into uh, common logic and CLIF notation. And from that, you could map to CGIF notation. Mm -hmm. And the CGIF is a linearization. So you can use that same linearization for many different graphs. And uh, uh, so I call it common uh, a conceptual graph interchange format, but uh, I also call it um, EGIF, existential graph interchange format for a subset of that. And you could also map RDF and any kind of graph to that. Yeah. So, I uh, talked to the Gracken people the other week, and uh, they they're uh, you know familiar with, with CGIF, and asked them you know kind of if they they could tell me a bit of difference that they they see in theirs and yours, and um, you know they 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 said you know it's pretty similar, but I I can tell that they're more looking at RDF and less common logic, you know, I mean, they've got a semantic ne network, but they said they were also willing to participate in these uh, talks, but uh, okay. they said they want to be invited, you know, like they didn't want to just end up showing up and um, if they weren't invited. Well, by all means, invite them. I mean, they yeah. say, well, let me know and I'll invite them. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I, I, I spoke with uh, Aaron about uh, uh, Aaron Majumdar, and uh, he apologized for not being able to log in there. And uh, so we, he suggested that uh, maybe December would be, uh, the first week of December might be good. But actually, I was thinking that maybe uh, he's still working on the software, and uh, maybe sometime in uh, the, the uh, either January or February might be a better time. Because uh, there's a lot that... Uh, 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 he could say, you know, I uh, basically I write my uh, graphs and way of stating things are usually clearer than what he says. So I would give the intro, but then Aaron can continue on forever with uh, more data. Uh, you, you can just uh, stick a nickel in and get uh, um, uh, a whole. Uh, uh, you know, you just can uh, treat him like a, a jukebox and you stick a nickel in and you get a, a, a pronouncement on anything. Yeah, I'm sure we can arrange that. Um, what, what I've shown here are comments that were made after your talk, uh, John. Okay. Um, yeah, let's see, I think Ravi and Janet are here. Yeah. So there were issues such as um, evolution of standards. Um, David Eddy asked about unnatural language. Yep. How do you deal with that? Well, um, if it's a formal that language, you, th that's easy. Formal languages are can be semantically, uh, syntactically translated to a lot of different things. and. Uh, they're much easier to deal with. But I'm not sure what he means by unnatural. I think he means these formal languages like. OK, uh, formal language. languages are easy. You mean, and specialized jargon and um, computer jargon. Yeah, yeah well. Uh, yeah, there's specialized jargon from different fields. From right, but that's, that's all in your. Uh, that's way between natural language and formal language. Yeah, well, see, that's, that's all in your ontology. And that's why psych. Uh, is the psych model is so important because they have 6,000, well, uh, when I say 6,000 micro theories, that's a number that uh, <coughs> was publicized a few years ago. But the point is that they can handle incompatibilities because they have a very simple up top level ontology and then uh, they can handle any kind of incompatible ontologies at the lower levels. Uh, by in their micro theories. And uh, Lennett doesn't like it when I say that the micro theories are incompatible with one another because that sounds bad, but actually it's good because 
things in the outside world are indeed incompatible. And the point is that when you have a separate micro theory for each one, the each one of those micro theories is incompatible with many of the other micro theories. However, if you uh, for any two micro theories in a lattice, the uh, they have a point above them, the least common uh, uh, ontology, a micro theory above them is the one that contains all the terms that are in common to them. And so then it shows exactly what is the parts that are they have in common. And then it shows which parts they don't have in common. And uh, so the the idea of having a lattice of all of the theories and micro theories gives you a framework in which you can very quickly tell, here's this jargon way down here on the left and another different jargon on the right. And then you can go up the uh, lattice and you see where is the uh, point that's the, the, uh, the, l the lowest point above the two. And that's the point in which they have the maximal com commonality. And that gives you a framework for dealing with these things. Good. Um, and and a, a couple of comments oh, that, about standards. Uh, what what standards are there for knowledge graphs? Is there any movement? Well, I think yeah. Mike's Mike's point was reacting to what John had said about the problem of getting. Um, stuck in a standard that would be a cul-de-sac. Um, so that led us to discuss a bit, um, and he said, so he was defending the idea of standards, and he, I think he, he mentioned dictionaries, and so then I responded that dictionaries are set up to be evolvable. They're, they're not uh, dead ends. They're, they give cases, they give a variety of cases of uses, so they don't provide fixed meanings. Um, they do tend to provide um, pronunciations, which is what they were originally intended for, apparently. Um, so that gets at what John was just talking about earlier, about what are the rates of change of, um, you know, the pronunciations change the, um, the least frequently. Um, the meanings there are new meanings that can be added to dictionaries which become just another case so you can have incompatible cases of of meanings and the dictionary is is set up to do that <laughs> so so that was just it was an so, interesting uh, contrast uh, a word as uh, is being used for two different things synonyms and other things uh, are right. also some areas of confusion that cause uncertainty in determining the context. Um, what uh, I want to ask about the so-called what was unnatural languages, namely computer languages, let's say, can they be mapped? Uh, can they be mapped to sentences in full languages? I oh, know the yes, comments, yes, 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 comments. definitely, yes, definitely. That's what. Uh, in fact, that uh, whole point I mentioned about cognitive memory, and uh, 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 and I was giving that lecture that the other day, that I was talking about cognitive memory and the projects that I, that uh, these are projects that uh, the, the first project that convinced me that we could form a new company was this project that Aaron Majumdar and Andre Leclerc uh, implemented in 19. No, yeah, no, that was in 2000. Uh, Aaron and I got together. Uh, when Aaron showed me that uh, example, that he, this was something that he had done in 2000, and he showed me that uh, when I was visiting Montreal, that I think that was in March of 2001, and he um, uh, wanted to go to have a, some a, a snack and uh, he pulled out his notebook with all these things. And this was the case a project in which they did the uh, uh, that the reverse engineering they did the uh, analysis of all of the software that had been developed for this company this was Towers Perrin which was a uh, one of the fortune uh, that 1000 companies so it was a fairly big uh, reinsurance company and they had 40 years of software 
uh, that had accumulated over the years and all and many many kinds of documents and data and emails and everything else and they wanted to do a complete analysis of all of that project of all of those interrelationships and uh, 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 have cross references and diagrams and uh, uh, data structure diagrams and flow charts and everything to represent 40 years worth of software because they wanted to do a complete uh, re-engineering and redesign of their of everything they had. They went to Accenture and Accenture uh, said it would take uh, 40 person years, uh, two years with uh, about 20 uh, people each to analyze everything and to produce a complete documentation of everything there with all the cross references. And uh, they then uh, uh, wanted a second opinion and that's when uh, they ended up with talking with uh, uh, Aaron and Andre. And they and Aaron and Andre signed up for a an eight week project. Uh, actually 15 person week project to uh, analyze all their data to see what could be done. And Aaron said, well, I have this uh, uh, software that I've been developing. I think we can do this automatically or semi-automatically. And so that's when Aaron applied the first application of what became VivoMind software to this uh, data. And they not only did the analysis, they did the complete analysis of all of the COBOL programs, the JCL, the job control language for IBM's uh, operating systems, and uh, all of the documents, emails, uh, and specifications, and the comments, the English comments in the COBOL code. And, uh, they, uh, and they used exactly the same parser for COBOL that they used for English. And Aaron would simply took an off-the-shelf COBOL grammar, translated it into uh, the version of Prolog that he was using. And so he used the COBOL grammar to analyze COBOL, and he derived an ontology for all of the software from COBOL. Because COBOL is a precise formal language, and so it was much easier to derive an ontology from COBOL than it was to derive the ontology from English. But once he had that ontology from English, he then took, uh, su uh, he had a supplemented ontology with, uh, from natural language, from WordNet and everything else. So he added the new ontology from COBOL to the ontology that he already had for English, and he used that combined ontology to analyze all the documents. So you first start by analyzing the formal languages, the unnatural languages, because they are much easier to analyze. Then you derive your ontology from that, and then you use that ontology to analyze the English documentation. And as a result of that, in 15 weeks' time, they completely uh, solved the problem and they produced a, a CD-ROM with all of the results on uh, one CD-ROM in that case. And the uh, Towers' parents says that's exactly what they wanted to Accenture to do for them. And Aaron and Andre did it in 15-person weeks of time. And uh, they were uh, and with 40-person weeks, 40-person years was the estimate that Accenture had. Now that's an example where you derive the ontology from the formal language, and then you use that uh, you use that ontology to add to your general ontology for for ordinary for for English, and you use a combined ontology to analyze um, both the programs and the documentation, and cross-reference the programs, the documentation, and all the stuff over the years. So you can look at the slides that I had. Uh, that I, those were the slides that I used uh, two weeks ago. You can use those slides. Yes, yes, yes. we were relating to that. As right. You, and so now the context is very clear that unnatural or these better uses formal languages versus natural languages, and how the ontologies based on natural languages can be enriched by using formal languages that have some sort of better logic built into that. Right. And the idea is that you take that uh, you can have any kind of jargon and any kind of 
symbol. So that the basically, uh, if you look at the documentation for those uh, programs, for the COBOL programs, there were lots of COBOL words in there, COBOL jargon. There was a lot of uh, names of various uh, files and uh, data files and the database. Oh yeah, they also did SQL as well because SQL is another formal language. And they related the documentation to what's the contents of the database and the contents of all the programs that access the database and the JCL, uh, the job control language that ran the system. And they used all the words that were derived from all of those as supplements to the English uh, uh, ontology. Um, given that this was so successful and so uh, long ago, um, the question is why why hasn't this taken over the world? Why hasn't this, um, what are the impediments? Um, okay, yeah. well the first thing is, uh, the point is that Towers Perrin had exactly the correct problem that this software could handle. And very few companies had exactly the same problem or stated in exactly the same way. Now we, uh, but when I saw that, uh, when Aaron showed me this data, I said, wow, this is sufficient. We can start a company and that's how we started VivoMind. But uh, one thing is we went around, we, went we, we needed money. And the question is, how do you get money well, from people that are going to fund research because what they wanted, what uh, VCs want to do is fund something that they can put, put money in two years, get a product, and then uh, uh, go to IPO. And this requires research, and they don't want to fund research. Now, we talked to uh, a couple of different groups. We talked to people. There was this company called Microfocus, which was doing a lot of Y2K work, and uh, we talked to one of the partners there. And um, he was really excited about this because they were doing a lot of mapping from uh, various uh, legacy stuff into uh, microfocus and other things. And they said, wow, uh, this partner w was very excited about it. He really wanted to support it. And we could partner with them in developing this. And we talked to uh, one of their chief uh, software guys. So the chief software guy and one of the partners, Aaron and I had a, a four way discussion. They were absolutely sold on it. Unfortunately, the majority partner uh, did not like the idea. And um, he says, no, I don't believe in it. And he killed it. Uh, we also talked to some companies that were doing various consulting things. And we talked to one consulting guy who w had been doing a lot of, <coughs> a lot of Y2K work and mapping, uh, doing uh, legacy re-engineering and all that stuff. And we uh, showed him this stuff and he says, you mean you took a 40 person year project and you cut it down to 15 person weeks? Uh, that lost multi millions of dollars worth of revenue. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and, we, <laughs> and there's all, and now we, we, but we had get, been getting funding uh, from, uh, there were a few large companies that were funding us. Uh, one was that oil, and uh, that was Chevron, and um, uh, that was funding that through the, uh, that was one point. Uh, uh, but we were getting the most of this funding from various uh, DOD projects, and um, either directly or indirectly from those, because we, the uh, VivoMind and Kinti software could do things that they could not do with any other projects. On the other hand, they were fund they were not funding us for developing the whole system. They were funding us on a project by project basis. And there's a huge difference between uh, the work done to work on a single project and the work done to work on a general purpose software and the work to re, uh, uh, to develop a general purpose software, I would compare that to the Jeopardy project that IBM Watson did. So there was Jeopardy project produced uh, a solution to this uh, major problem, which is winning the Jeopardy game. And the idea was, the hope was that that could be spun off to general purpose projects. Well, as you can see, IBM Watson has projects that are making a dent 
in the AI uh, field. However, uh, taking something that works on a, when you have, there's a difference between the work where the people who know the product produce a solution versus the kind of stuff where you produce a uh, product that anybody can use. There's an immense gap between those two kinds of things. And uh, uh, Jans Osman can tell you a lot about that because what they have been doing is producing things like Allegro Graph. And well, they started out with Franz Lisp and they produced a version of Prolog. So they sell a version of Prolog. They have a version of Lisp and they have Allegro Graph, which is a version. But these are all tools that require people to have a high level of skill in order to be able to use them. And there are very few people who have a high level of skills. There's, uh, so that's always a niche market kind of thing. And uh, so the people who produce these tools, there's a niche market for tools. There's an immense market for applications, but uh, the thing is, who's going to take the tools to produce the applications? And we have learned a lot of lessons the hard way in ways that sort of keep this company sort of piddling along, but never really breaking out of the piddle. Mm -hmm. That's and what point. about, um, well, and then there's the, the standards possibility. Well, of, yeah, sorry or, if I break in here, but uh, we've gone way over the hour. Uh, I think what we should do is adjourn and continue this discussion next week. Um, we'll also hopefully have more people because we won't have the conflict uh, with Joe again. Because yeah, Joe is taking place right now. Okay. Finishing. Well, I'm, I'm actually happy that we have these. But this was a great session. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah very good. Uh, uh, so I'm going to stop the recording now.